Saturday's March for a ceasefire in Gaza will go ahead. The culmination of one of the stupidest stories I have witnessed for a very long time, a march which is not happening on the day when uh, the remembrance service will take place, which is going nowhere near the cenotaph, but which for some reason everyone suddenly decided it's it's impossible to march anywhere near um, Remembrance Sunday. Very, very bizarre. But Rishi Sunak has met um, the chief of the police, the chief of the Met Police, and he has admitted, accepted it will be happening, even if it makes him very uncomfortable. That's our lead story tonight. I'll be discussing that with Rivka Brown. Rivka, how are you doing? Good, although absolutely appalled not to have been supplied with poppies by our producer. Oh, that is true. Actually, we maybe should get some in tomorrow. I do, if when I go on mainstream telly, I always wear one and I do kind of enjoy the sort of, you know, it makes you seem like you are. Obviously, it's good to respect tradition. I mean, although I have to say, actually, the last few days have, have really shown, I think, the dark side of Remembrance Sunday, right? It's, it, it doesn't seem to be about remembering the horrors of war and trying to make sure they never happen again. It seems to be about right. celebrating war. And it's now, you know, suddenly a, a big problem if anyone suggests a ceasefire on Armistice Day. I don't know if anyone saw the videos on 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 Twitter of, of the, the army soldiers sort of fighting, you know, I think it was Waterloo Station and getting kicked in the balls. And that's sort of how we're supposed to remember um, the, the lives lost um, in the in the First World War, um, not by discussing how we could end wars happening right now. Um, coming up later tonight, we are going to be discussing this human shields argument that keeps coming up. Anytime someone wants to defend killing thousands upon thousands of civilians, including lots of children, they say, oh, the problem is human shields. It's not Israel's fault. It's Hamas who use them as human shields. We're going to have a go at debunking what I think has become a pretty nonsense. And I actually, you know, I find it a very unpleasant talking point because of how much it devalues Palestinian lives. Um, we're also going to talk about the United States and how they let Israel get away with so much. They give them their weapons and they say, we have no red lines. The Metropolitan Police have confirmed that the march this Saturday in London calling for a Gaza ceasefire will go ahead. Appearing on BBC Breakfast, Met Commissioner Mark Rowley explained why. The remembrance events will not be disturbed. Whatever protests and other events go on, we will do our utmost to protect those because they are so critical. People shouldn't be in fear that those are going to be compromised. We will do everything possible to make sure they're not. The second point about protest, though, there will be a protest this weekend. Parliament's very clear about that. The law provides no mechanism to ban a gathering, a static protest, a rally, anything like that. There's no mechanism whatsoever to ban such a thing. And if the organisers want that, then it will happen. The government has now accepted Rowley is right and the march will go ahead. But Rishi Sunak hasn't sounded too happy about it. He said this before meeting with Mark Rowley. Yeah, this is a decision that the Metropolitan Police Commissioner has made and he has said that he can ensure that he safeguards remembrance uh, for the country this weekend as well as keep the public safe. Now, my job is to hold him accountable for that and we've asked the police for information on how they will ensure that this happens. You know, my view is that these marches are uh, disrespectful and uh, that's what I'll be discussing with the police commissioner later today. So it's disrespectful to call for an armistice on Armistice Day and the police will have to make sure that it's very safe. Now, it's all a bit rich, given the only risk of disorder on Saturday will be thanks to his Home Secretary whipping up a moral panic about anti-war marches and therefore emboldening the far right. Now, that's something recognised by one of the few remaining rational Tories. Saeed Abbasi tweeted this, Far right and football hooligans main risk of disorder at pro-Palestinian march, police fear. This is what the Home Secretary has unleashed with her divisive rhetoric. Culture wars may win you headlines, but they damage our country. Now, that divisive rhetoric from Braverman included branding the pro-Palestine demo a, quote, hate march. Right? The article that Varsi was sharing is from the I newspaper. It reports this. Prominent far-right figures, as well as groups linked to football hooliganism, have issued rallying cries for supporters to descend on London this weekend, with some organising to meet at locations such as Victoria Station before gathering to, quote, protect monuments. Messages in one anti-Islamic WhatsApp group seen by I containing more than a thousand members calls on people to fight back against pro-Palestinian protesters, with one adding no surrender to these C-word. Um, this is our house. 
Um, members from as far afield as Scotland vowed to travel to London, with others claiming to be on high alert for pro-Palestinian demonstrations in Middlesbrough. A voice note of English Defence League founder Tommy Robinson was also shared in the group. Um, the pretext for the right's opposition to the protest is that marching for Palestine on Armistice Day is disrespectful to the war dead and may disrupt remembrance ceremonies. Now, that doesn't stack up. Armistice ceremonies are on the Sunday. The demo is on the Saturday. The two-minute silence on Saturday is at 11 a.m. The protest doesn't start until past midday. And the protest was never intended to go anywhere near the cenotaph. So all of the various moral, pa moral panics we've had about this march have, have no basis in reality. It's a complete farce. And those opposing this farce have now won a surprising ally. Many Brits consider Winston Churchill, their biggest war hero, his grandson, the Tory peer Nicholas Soames, told LBC this. My view, I'm afraid, it, it is not that of many people in my party. I, I think that a lot of people died during the war to assert right. freedom. And, you know, I, because you may not agree or disagree with their views and because it is very contentious and very difficult, it's going to put tremendous strain on the police, uh, I think it must be allowed to go ahead. It's nowhere near the cenotaph. It's, it's, it's in the afternoon, it's our thing. And most of those people, 90% of those people are not there to make trouble. They're there to express a deeply held view. And I, I, I think it must be allowed to go ahead. And I think it would be a great mistake to play politics with. Soames put many of his Tory colleagues to shame there, but it's not just politicians who are embarrassing themselves over Saturday's march, and hysterical media coverage has become a parody of itself. This was a GB News report from earlier this week. Well, you'll see the cenotaph here in Rochdale just over my shoulder, and our eagle-eyed viewers will notice that currently there are no reeds there whatsoever. Obviously, in the footage, as you say, we see that gentleman uh, removing the Palestinian flags of various sizes and replacing those poppy reeds. Now, Rochdale Borough Council, in a statement, have said... Having looked into the circumstances, we can confirm that the reeds blew over during the recent bad weather and have now been secured. The flags had been left by children who'd been taking photographs on the monument. The cenotaph and our other war, war memorials are incredibly important monuments. They should be respected by everyone and we are very proud of them and our strong links with our armed forces, community, past and present. Now, we have reached out to Rochdale Borough Council to ask why there are currently no reeds there on the cenotaph, but we haven't heard back yet, so we will have to wait and see exactly uh, what they come back with on that. Now, of course, it's Remembrance Sunday this week. It's something that this cenotaph is just one of many up and down the nation where people will come on Sunday uh, for a silent moment of reflection and to remember our fallen veterans, as they said in the statement, both past and present. This is a live report from the cenotaph in Rochdale where some poppies have blown away. Uh, a reef has blown away and GB News has sent out their hard-hitting journalists to cover the drama. I was surprised she wasn't wearing a, a press jacket and a helmet there. I was saying, oh, we think the poppy has blown away. The, the poppy is now 50 metres away from the cenotaph. Someone's trying to catch it. Oh, dogs just run in front of it. Ah, oh, there's so much action. Um, very, very dramatic television there. That was more ridiculous than anything I ever saw on the day to day. Um, I've got one more clip for you because while GB News are making mountains out of molehills over on ITV, they're just making things up. I'm sure Sir Mark Rowley and the Metropolitan Police would prefer there was not a march on Saturday. And I'm sure they've been talking to a lot of the groups involved. Mm. And there'll be a lot of the Palestinian groups who don't want it to go ahead. But the question is, can't the whole march be stopped? And that seems now very unlikely. There will be lots of Palestinian groups who don't want the march to go ahead. Um, Rivka, I wonder, I mean, maybe Ed Balls is better connected um, in the, the pro-Palestine movement than either you or I. Um, but do, do you think he has any evidence that there are lots of pro-Palestinian groups or lots of Palestinian groups that, that, that really don't want this march to go ahead? I mean, as you say, I'm not sure what telegram groups Ed Balls is in, but they're clearly not the same ones I am. Um, it, I mean, if there is any trepidation about um, 
you know, the, the march on Saturday and whether people should attend. It is solely because of the moral panic that the Home Secretary has whipped up and with it, the, the ire that she's directed of the far right. People are worried, but they're not worried because it's disrespectful. They're worried because they're going to get their heads kicked in, you know. And we know historically that the police, when it comes to protecting uh, protesters, will always privilege the safety and the interests of the far right, despite the fact that they themselves know and admitted in 2019, that the far right, not the left, not pro-Palestine marches, not uh, you know, uh, anti-race, um, anti-racist protesters represent the fastest growing terrorist threat in the UK. They themselves admit this. And yet every time something like this happens, it's always the left and not the right that are made out to be the greatest menace. Or in the case of that GB News report that you just showed, the wind blowing over the Rochdale cenotaph. It's never the far right and its presence, which is scrutinized. You know, it takes a rogue member of the, the Tory member of the House of Lords, like Saeed Dawasi or um, Nicholas Soames, both people who are much more insulated from the day to day of, um, you know, party politics because they're in the Lords, who who can, you know, be the voices of reason, um, you know. The, the, the fact is that the, the real reason people are marching this weekend, as Nicholas Soames says, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy um, agreeing with him, is because they have deeply held views. And what we're seeing with the, the, the way that this is being set up, Armistice Weekend. I mean, I've never even heard of Armistice Weekend being talked of in this way. Remembrance Sunday is now Armistice Weekend. It's going to be Armistice Month, you know, before we know it. But the reason this, this kind of shadow boxing match is being set up between Armistice this weekend and the pro-Palestine uh, marches is in order to create a sort of non-existent conflict between Western civilization and the angry uh, mob um, from the east, you know, of the of the Orient. Um, and we and, and we know this because we have Telegraph columnists writing exactly this. I was reading um, a column just just today, claiming that Western civilization is imploding all around us. You know, this is part of a broader attempt. This kind of framing of poppies versus Palestine is part of a broader attempt to represent supporters of Palestine as being a fundamental threat to Western civilization from within as a kind of um, counter to British values. But, you know, the British values that we're talking about, the kinds of things that people are tested on in order to become, um, you know, uh, uh, in order to gain their citizenship to this country are things like democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, tolerance of different faiths, participation in community life. You know, I'm reading this off a list the government has has uh, produced. Who is defending these kinds of rights, if not pro-Palestine marches? Defending the rule of international law as it applies to Palestinians and Israelis. Defending a democratic state that treats all of its, of its citizens equally. Defending tolerance of Jews and Muslims living alongside each other, participating in community life, for God's sakes. Like, if there's anyone that is standing up for British values at this moment, it's people who are marching for Palestine. Got a, a very minor correction. So the, the wind hadn't blown over the Rochdale cenotaph, which would have actually been a bit more newsworthy. It just it just blown away uh, some, some poppies. So um, just to clarify that, um, Rivka, I suppose there, there was one bit there. You sort of said we have evidence that the police are always protecting the far right when they protest over the left. I, I, I think you've definitely got a point when it comes to politicians. I think absolutely, Suella Braverman has been sort of claiming that the left are absolutely something they're not, whilst whipping up the hatred of the far right. I mean, in, in this situation, it seems, you know, obviously there are a hell of a lot of things to critique the Metropolitan Police for. In this situation, it do doesn't seem like they've done a bad job, right? They've said, well, this is, this is a protest. There's no law against this protest, so it will go ahead. Or am, mm -hmm. I, am I missing something? No, no. I mean, it's obviously it's obviously a good thing that they've U-turned and said that the protest should go ahead. Um, it's questionable as to um, why that is. You know, it could be that it's just impossible to police the sheer number of people that is being expected. You know, we saw um, at the weekend footage of police officers um, at last weekend's protest on the 4th of November, um, officers shipped in from Wales, from, you know, across England. Uh, and this weekend, as momentum grows behind the protest movement, this weekend's march is is uh, provisionally titled the Million Man March. If there's a million people marching through central London, it won't be possible to enforce a Section 14 public um, order ban. You know, the last time that the police enforced a similar ban, I believe, was in 2011 um, over an EDL march. Now, that march probably, you know, involved 
a few thousand, maybe tens of thousands at a push. Uh, but, you know, this is exponentially larger than that. So it could just be a question of sheer practicality and the idea that if they enforce a ban and the, the protest goes ahead anyway and they fail to, to um, police it, it's going to be a massive uh, display of weakness on the police's part. So perhaps they've just decided not to bother. Yeah, I suppose I was only, I'm just not sure, you know, when, when there are the far right and the far left sort of on protesters, I don't tend to think they sort of let the far right have free reign and then clamp down on the far left. But potentially, if you think the Tories are in disarray over Palestine, then let me introduce you to the Labour Party. Now, it's now had its first front bench resignation over Keir Starmer's stance on the war on Gaza. Imran Hussain was Labour's shadow minister for the New Deal for Working People, um, but he resigned last night. This is his resignation letter to Keir Starmer. Over recent weeks, it has become clear that my view on the ongoing humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza differs substantially from the position you have adopted. As I write, more than 1,400 Israelis and over 10,000 Palestinian civilians have been killed in the last month. This shocking number of fatalities is set to grow as indiscriminate attacks and the siege of Gaza continues. Yesterday, the United Nations Secretary General warned that Gaza is becoming a graveyard for children and stated that a humanitarian ceasefire becomes more urgent with every passing hour. And he goes on, given the crisis unfolding, I wish to be a strong advocate for the humanitarian ceasefire advocated by the UN General Secretary, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and other UN humanitarian bodies by numerous governments and by leading humanitarian organizations like Oxfam, Save the Children and Amnesty International. It is clear that I cannot sufficiently in all good conscience do this from the front bench given its current position. Um, now, he may be the first shadow minister to depart the shadow um, front bench over Starmer's support for Israel's assault on Gaza, but Hussein's resignation is a sign of increasing unease amongst Labour MPs. Fifteen front benches have publicly called for a ceasefire or shared other people's calls on social media, and so far, 330 Labour councillors have signed a letter demanding Starmer calls for a ceasefire, while dozens have already resigned. Some Labour MPs are also using parliamentary procedure to gather support for a ceasefire. Labour MP Zara Sultana has said this. Every day Israel's assault on Gaza continues. More innocent Palestinians will be brutally killed. So long as our government rejects a ceasefire, it is complicit in this slaughter. I have tabled this amendment to the King's speech calling on the government to back a ceasefire. Um, Richard Bergen, for his part, posted this. And um, so he says a new parliamentary motion. Um, for a ceasefire. So he's put down the first backbench motion of the new parliamentary session, calling for a ceasefire to save lives. It already has the support of 93 MPs from eight different parties. So I think actually they're talking um, about the same um, proposal there because they, they, they proposed it jointly. Hussein is one of the signatories to Bergen's motion. ITV's political correspondent Shahab Khan had this bit of detail about Hussein's resignation. New I'm told Imran Hussein was told if he signed the early day motion in the Commons calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, he would be fired from the front bench. He signed it and would probably have been fired this morning. Instead, he chose to resign at 11.17pm last night. So we have seen up to now there, as we've said, many front benches have sort of called for a ceasefire either by tweeting their support or by retweeting other people. Apparently now, um, Keir Starmer is going to get a bit more strict on these things. Um, so why won't Labour call for a ceasefire? Speaking on Radio 4's Today programme, Shadow Education Secretary Bridget Phillipson laid out the party's position. Just, just to spell out to people who are genuinely confused about this, why ask for a pause but not a ceasefire, a ceasefire that would have kept Mr Hussain in the, uh, on the shadow team and, and indeed would alleviate the fears of a lot of other Labour members? Well, as Keir Starmer set out in his speech at Chatham House, it would freeze the conflict in time. It risks allowing Hamas to regroup and to, to perpetuate further uh, terrible atrocities that they've said that they want the opportunity to do. But that humanitarian pause to allow for extra time to get into, uh, for aid to get into Gaza is in line with what the US are calling for as well. I believe it's achievable. Not only is it achievable, but I believe it is essential so that we can alleviate that suffering, get more aid in uh, and make sure that um, we don't see children yeah. as the innocent victims but, of this conflict. But just to, to, to and finally on this subject, it, it is a point of principle, he says, and we were hearing from a Labour councillor has also resigned about about this being a point of principle. But it sounds from what you've just said about freezing the conflict and allowing Hamas to regroup, given the things that they have done, it, it is also a point of principle for the Labour leadership. Uh, I, I do understand how colleagues feel on this. I mean, we are all of us every day 
moved by what we see uh, on our television screens, what we read about, the full extent of not just the barbarity of what we saw on the 7th of October, but subsequently the humanitarian crisis that has emerged in Gaza. What we all want to see in our primary focus is on making sure that aid does get in, but also in the long run that we see a lasting political settlement. That is the only way through this. I mean, it feels very distant at the moment. I recognise that. But what we all want is a viable Palestinian state alongside a safe and secure Israel. It's so intensely dishonest. It's so intensely dishonest, Labour's position on this. We wouldn't want to freeze the situation as it is. It, the situation where Israel is still expanding its settlements in the West Bank, kicking people out of their homes. You've got nothing to say about that. Freeze the situation where Gaza has been under siege for 17 years. Nothing to say about that. All you care about is destroying Hamas, which is impossible, by the way. You know, it's not going to be possible to destroy an organization, which, I mean, we don't know how much support it has because there haven't been elections for a while, but it has, you know, a significant amount of, of support. It's not just, they're, they're not this group of outsiders that have come and sort of taken over the Palestinian movement. No, they've been in charge of Gaza for 17 years. They did win elections initially, right? They, they, they run the strip, right? The idea you can just bomb them into obliteration I mean, it's, it's, it's regime change, isn't it? They're talking about regime change, which we have seen how that goes over the past two decades. It doesn't go well. Lots of people die for no good reason. So this idea that it would freeze the situation, you, you, you don't want to cease fire. I want to freeze the situation now, right? I think in the immediate term, what do you want to do? For the next three weeks, let's goddamn freeze the situation. Let's make sure people stop dying because too many people are dying every day, right? Freeze. I think actually a pause would be a good thing. Then... Let's talk about how we could actually have some justice in Israel-Palestine. And that's not just by asking for a two-state solution. So the Labour position is what we're going to let Israel do is do everything they want, bomb Gaza as much as they want, increase their power, right, because they want that land. They don't, they don't want a sort of successful, flourishing Palestinian um, society in Gaza. They want to destroy it, right? So give them everything they want, give them free reign to destroy Gaza, and then ask nicely at the end, oh, and by the way, can we have two states as well? What do you think Israel are going to say to that? They're going to laugh. All right. Oh, thanks for letting us bomb Gaza. Um, but you want, us, you want us to do two states? Well, why would we accept that? We've got all the power. The Palestinians have no power. If all you're going to do is ask us nicely, then we're going to keep doing what we're doing, which is ethnically cleansing Palestinians in what they call greater Israel. So all of the land between the river and the sea. Yes, they're allowed to say it. Rivka, um, I suppose we are seeing continued opposition from within the Labour Party, but the, the front bench are uh, staying steadfast in their highly principled position um, for bombing women and children. Right. <laughs> and I would love to say that Imran Hussain's resignation or Zara Sultana's motion or R Richard Berger's motion or Zara Sultana's amendment to the King's speech um, are going to make you know, a massive difference. But we already know that the uh, Labour leadership views those people, all of whom were supporters of Corbyn, Imran Hussein served in Corbyn's uh, shadow cabinet and uh, w supported uh, Rebecca Long-Bailey for the leadership with Richard Bergen as deputy. You know, we already know it views them with utter contempt. We had a source describing, an anonymous Labour source describing to Lee Harpin at the Church News, uh, the people who were leaving the party over its stance on Israel as shaking off fleas. We think, you know, th this just is entirely indicative of how Labour views people who have principled opposition to its stance on Israel from within the party. And that includes people like Imran Hussein, whose, you know, Muslimness uh, is, 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 is definitely not going to act in his favour. They've definitely, they've taken for, like all of the people who vote for Labour that are Muslim, they will have taken Imran Hussein's support for granted. And the loss of it won't, you know, won't, 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 uh, fluster them at all. Um, I think, you know, what we're seeing here and what you can see so clearly in Bridget Phillips, uh, Phillipson's interview there with the BBC um, is, is that the Labour Party doesn't have a position on this at all. It has the US position on this. It, she describes Labour as being in line with the US. And those, those, that's the key word, really. That's the operative term. All Labour is trying to do is to remain in lockstep with the US for as long as it needs to um, in order to kind of allow this to blow over and not to allow it to become, you know, not to allow Palestine to become a kind of wedge issue um, or a stick with which to beat the Labour Party as it was so effectively with Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and also keep in lockstep with the US government so that uh, to, to sort of signal to, to 
one of Britain's most important diplomatic um, sort of allies, that a Keir Starmer government would not be a threat to the establishment. Um, And so there are some very important kind of diplomatic signals, I think, being sent out by the Labour Party. It's much more about that, I would say, than it is about any kind of um, principled opposition or support uh, for the Israeli state. Um, But I think, you know, what is so striking when you hear Labour politicians talking about uh, the situation in Israel and Palestine is the different um, sort of value that they attach to Palestinian and Israeli life. You know, even just the past, it's it's always in passing that Palestinian suffering is mentioned. It's the barbarity of the 7th of October attacks, which, by the way, is the date that the uh, conflict between Israel and Palestine began, the date that the occupation began, the date that the blockade of uh, Gaza began, um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, day one of the conflict is the 7th of October. Um, and everything after that is unfortunate humanitarian suffering. Um, and it's just, it, it's just like mind boggling to hear kind of Palestinians kind of like uh, mentioned as this sort of afterthought in her comments. And it just like, it's so indicative. I wish people would pay more attention to the kind of language and the phrasing that's used. It's always, always, always Israelis were massacred by Hamas on the 7th of October, and since then, some Palestinians have died as well. Not mentioning that the number of Palestinians that have now been killed by the IDF numbers like almost 10 times as many as was killed as were killed by Hamas on the 7th of October. Two thirds of those Israeli deaths of it were, were of Israeli militants, not Israeli civilians. So, you know, the, the, the numbers are just like, I mean, they just kind of absolutely uh, boggle the mind. But to the mind of a, a, a Labour politician, cosy in their sort of Radio 4 studio, chatting it over with, uh, with their BBC interviewer, it's just like, it's as if it's as if it hasn't happened at all. It just, uh, I, I saw a tweet to that effect about like whether it was military victims of, of Hamas or not. I was confused about this because is it potentially just because everyone does military service in Israel, right? So everyone is potentially a reservist. So you could, you could call everyone of, 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 of military age a, a reservist. I, 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 I'm, I'm saying this, I don't know the answer, but I'm just, when I saw that tweet, I was wondering, is this the case that they were wearing uniform and they were, you know, they were military officers? at the time mm. that they were killed? Or is it just that these are people who are reservists because they've done military service? I don't know if, you, if you're if you able to clarify. Or... Yeah, I don't have, I actually don't um, have more information on that. And I would, I would like to know that. I do though, I am though aware that hundreds of thousands of reservists have been called up, you know, in the past month alone. And so many of the people that would have been civilians are now wearing uniforms. Mm. So it is a very um, complicated picture and one that Israel has deliberately tried to to manipulate, you know, whilst at the same time um, presenting, you know, on its own um uh, you know, web web pages and 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 its own kind of um, tallying of the Palestinian deaths, presenting those it has killed as Hamas terrorists. Every mm. single person it has killed is a Hamas terrorist, including seven year olds. You know, in in Gazan hospitals. Yeah, I suppose also Israel don't make the distinction between this is a Hamas member who was on duty or a Hamas member who wasn't. They're like, if they're a member of Hamas, we can kill them. I mean, to be honest, they're, if they can, you know, if, if they can move, you, Israel thinks they can kill them. But um, th- those distinctions between civilian and military are also very much blurred um, on the Israeli side. Israel has killed more than 10,000 people in Gaza, 4,000 of them children. They bombed schools, they bombed ambulances, and they bombed hospitals. But when challenged on this, they always have one answer. We're allowed to do it because Hamas uses human shields. This was Israeli government spokesman Elon Levy speaking to Sky News. The fighting in northern Gaza is going to get dangerous. It's going to get dangerous because Hamas has literally embedded itself under people's homes, under schools, underneath hospitals. And those are all legitimate targets under international law. When Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says the UK wants Israel to win, it wants us to go after these terror targets so they can never perpetrate the massacre again. And we hope that civilians will continue heeding our warning. My understanding of international law is that they are only... Um, targets that you can aim at as long as civilians are not in the path of those missiles and rockets. No, that that is so. It's important that we're on the same page about international law, and I know that's very important uh, for British, uh, important, very important for British audiences, especially. Okay. International law says that medical units may not be used under any circumstances to shield military targets. The fact that Hamas has its military headquarters in the basement of the Shifa Hospital is a war crime. Period. 
Now, that argument about so-called human shields has travelled far and wide. The Washington Post ran this grim cartoon this week. It shows a caricature of a Hamas leader with children, a baby, a woman strapped to his body. And it has the Hamas leader saying, how dare Israel attack civilians? Now, I cannot think of anything more dehumanising there are entire families dying right now, and you have this sick caricature, right? It's, it's, it's disgusting. The human shield argument isn't just being deployed, though, by Israeli spokespeople or racist cartoonists. Politicians, supposedly of the centre-left, are getting in on the act. Here's Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting on Newsnight. From what you are seeing... Is it carrying out that operation within international law? Well, I, I'm deeply disturbed by the scale of civilian casualties, particularly the number of children and the stark warning from the United Nations we've seen today. I acknowledge that for Israel, this is fiendishly difficult because you've got Hamas that embeds itself in civilian population, uses buildings like schools and hospitals as bunkers to hide within. That's really difficult. Is it within an international law? Um, I, I, I would urge Israel, the Labour Party would urge Israel to remain within international law. When I'm you see, you, is it? Well, look, I, from I think, what you see, I think, I think to be honest, uh, we're going to have to see as the facts emerge and well, evolve. The and... U, hang on, the UN says it's breaking international law. Amnesty says it's breaking international law. The Red Cross says it's breaking international law. Well, in Israel needs to act within international law, but and, and any, there are, there are any organisations saying it's already breaking a, it. Accusations where Israel is accused of breaking international law needs to be properly investigated, uh, and I think particularly when it comes to accusations, for example, of the use of white phosphorus, that is prohibited under international law. When it comes to specific targets, schools, hospitals, they are protected under international law. The complication in international law comes in when Hamas are using those buildings as facilities to okay. launch attacks. Now, that was the Shadow Health Secretary arguing in favour of bombing hospitals. Now, it's also important to note, right, he said there, any, any um, suspected war crime has to be properly investigated. Then he just completely repeated um, IDF Israeli propaganda that they have uh, Hamas militants in bunkers in hospitals. Now, I don't know either way, but we haven't seen any evidence for that. Yet, where Streeting seems very, very happy to repeat it on Newsnight if it's Israeli propaganda. But when it comes to the use of white phosphorus, oh, suddenly it needs to be investigated by some independent arbiter. So when it's an Israeli claim, oh, yeah, I'll just repeat that. Yeah, 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 yeah. they're using all these hospitals as bunkers. Where's the evidence, where Streeting? Suddenly has this really high standard of, of, of evidence when it comes to white phosphorus. I think it's, it's pretty disgusting. Um, we are going to talk you through, though, the reality behind um, this argument about human shields. Um, it is a category that exists under international humanitarian law, and it is illegal to use people as human shields. Now, it's also the case that the side using human shields does share some blame if civilians die when an opponent, when an opponent bombs a legitimate target. All right, so th this is a concept that exists in law. It's not completely um, bogus. That wouldn't, however, give Israel can't blanche. Now, any attack still needs to be proportionate. Even if human shields are used, it still needs to be proportionate. And killing 80 people at a refugee camp to get at one Hamas commander, as Israel have done, doesn't sound like it meets that threshold. Right, so you can't say, oh, they were all human shields. If you're killing 80 people, I think the majority of them were women and children, you can't say, oh, they were human shields, so it's fine. No, it has to be proportionate. Now, the other question is whether Hamas actually uses human shield, shields. Do its actions meet the threshold of using human shields? Now, we can start here with this definition from the International Committee of the Red Cross's Humanitarian Law Database. So they say, the use of human shields requires an intentional co-location of military objectives and civilians or persons hors de combat with the specific intent of trying to prevent the targeting of those military objectives. So you have two things here. First, there has to be the intention to put civilians and military objectives in the same place. So civilian and military sort of infrastructure in the same place or people. And second, when putting them in the same place, it has to be for the specific reason of preventing that military target from being attacked. Now, that means that simply having civilian infrastructure near to military targets doesn't meet the threshold. Of course, to use the previous example, a target being in a refugee camp doesn't make the refugees human shields unless the target is there specifically to use those refugees as human shields. And given Gaza is a very densely populated place, which is being bombed left, right and centre, it's not implausible that civilians and military personnel might just sometimes happen to be in the same place. Israel's argument gets even weaker if we look at the damage done to Gaza as a whole. So according to the UN, a third of all buildings in northern Gaza have been destroyed or damaged 
by Israeli bombardment. Now you have to ask, does Israel really think that one in every three buildings is a center of Hamas operations, placed specifically there to avoid being bombed? They're using all of those buildings, all of those civilians in them as human shields. Even if they were, does Israel really have persuasive evidence that one in every three buildings is shielding a military target so impressive, so powerful, that it justifies the destruction of countless civilian infrastructure and lives? Blocks of flats. The reason 10,000 people have died so far in Gaza is because they are bombing all of these civilian infrastructure. Blocks of flats, schools, hospitals, everything is getting bombed, right? And if they can't show that they were specifically using those civilians as as um, human shields, and that it was proportionate, then it's a war crime, right? Maybe West Street team should look this stuff up. We can also look at specific claims that Israel has made about particular buildings. To give one example, the IDF published this video earlier this week. Look at this picture. What do you see? At first glance, you might think this is a school or a hospital, but Hamas sees this as a legitimate place to store weapons such as rockets. Now, in that clip, you saw this. The IDF says that this opening here is a tunnel used by Hamas to store weapons located in the grounds of the Qatari hospital in Gaza City. The video is clearly being used to justify a possible future attack on the hospital or or other hospitals, for that matter. Um, There is, however, no evidence. The image shows what Israel says it does. And an Al Jazeera digital investigation has now cast doubt on Israel's claims. Enter Al Jazeera's digital investigations team, Sanad. It decided to take a closer look at the video behind this latest Israeli allegation. It started by identifying features surrounding this opening and cross-referencing those features with satellite images to determine its exact location. The team also uncovered footage filmed during the construction of the hospital published eight years ago. One of the clips reveals the construction of an underground, isolated, and enclosed structure in the exact location of the opening in question. The video makes plain that the construction Israel alleges to be a Hamas tunnel took place while the hospital complex was being built. According to the images in this archival video, this structure is not only not connected to any underground tunnel system. But after further analysis, our digital investigations team found that this structure is nothing more than a water reservoir. To further verify its finding, the team tracked down one of the original engineers who worked on the construction of the Qatari hospital. عملت لشهور في مشروع إنشاء المستشفى الشيخ حمد الأطراف الصناعية جيش الاحتلال عرض في الجهة الشرقية من المستشفى فوهة خرسانية كان عبارة عن فوهة لخزان مياه تحت الأرض يطل منه فوق سطح الأرض فوهة خرسانية وغطاء معدني وأنبوب للتهوية الذي يستخدم لإخراج وتصريف الهواء بعد دخول المياه إلى الخزان By cross-referencing his diagram with the images in the video released by the Israeli army, our digital investigations team was able to clearly identify a pressure equalization pipe commonly used for water and fuel tanks or reservoirs. Its conclusion, the only thing this video confirms is that there is a water tank on the property, not a tunnel used by Hamas fighters. Now, as you might guess, I'm not an expert on on water tanks, and I don't claim to be. Um, But that Al Jazeera investigation seems more compelling than the Israeli one, than the Israeli justification. We've seen seen this square, and therefore it must be a Hamas tunnel. Now, that seems especially unconvincing to me, as Hamas tunnels aren't known to just have clear openings next to public buildings, right? They they are military infrastructure. They aren't supposed to be easy to find. Um, Rivka, what do you make of this argument about human shields? It's being deployed by everyone. You saw there where's streeting. Um, it's, it's, it's the main right-wing talking point, actually. Oh, they've killed 10,000 people. Well, that's not Israel's fault. That's Hamas's fault because they're using them as human shields. What are Israel supposed to do if there are civilians in the way of their targets? They've got to kill the civilians. Yeah, it's being used because it's a brilliant loophole for the, uh, you know, for following international law. Well, we couldn't because these were human shields. I think what's incredible to me is how the international community doesn't consider that the burden of proof is on Israel, who's making these allegations rather than, um, you know, Hamas or uh 
independent media outlets such as Al Jazeera to disprove them. You know, Israel, which has one of the most advanced militaries in the world, which is famed for its intelligence capabilities, although they obviously failed spectacularly on the 7th of October, you know, famed so much that its alumni of its uh, intelligence organizations go on to found the NSO group and Black Cube and become mercenaries for state and non-state actors around the world. Incredible to me that this advanced Israeli military and intelligence operation isn't capable of providing any compelling evidence that Hamas are in fact using human shields. But an Al Jazeera investigation, which, you know, an Al, Al Jazeera, which has vastly, an infinitesimally smaller, uh, you know, amount of resources than the Israeli state can produce compelling evidence that Hamas isn't using these sites um, to, to sort of as bunkers and therefore the people occupying these buildings as human shields. It's incredible to me that nobody nobody makes that argument. Where is the evidence? You have one of the best funded militaries in the world. Where are the receipts? But I think, you know, what's, what's also really important here, and it reminds me of, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago with the massive discussion around whether or not uh, Israel bombed Al-Akhli Hospital. Now, I, I I do believe it is important uh, for the media to report accurately on this. I do believe it's important to get to the bottom of who bombed the hospital. But what we've seen since is that Israel has indiscriminately bombed that and other hospitals. Israel is telling us repeatedly that it does not have any concern for civilian life in Palestine, in Gaza or in the West Bank, and it hasn't for 75 years. You know, we've seen... Um, Israel bombing roads that it's encouraged Palestinians to flee across. We've seen Israel uh, bombing ambulances that people are trying to seek medical treatment. And we've seen white phosphorus being dropped. Now, the reason that white phosphorus has become indisputable as an accusation is because you can see it falling from the sky. <laughs> and so Israel has no, has no way to defend itself against that allegation. So it's just given up on doing that. I don't see why more isn't being made of that. And, you know, the, do people realize the kind of effects that white phosphorus has? It literally burns your skin right off of your body. So, you know, regardless, it's almost sort of like secondary to me, the question of whether or not Israel is using um, Palestinians as human shields in uh, specific situations such as hospitals or schools, because we know that it has no concern for Palestinian life in every other thing that it does. It's been shooting people indiscriminately in the West Bank. It's been taking hostages such as the uh, activist um, uh uh, Ahed Tamimi and her father, who's now in administrative detention for six months, which could be extended up to a year. You know, these are all very normal, quotidian parts of Israeli apartheid that pre-existed and predated the 7th of October and have been accelerating since then. And, and, and proving to us day after day, uh, rhetorically, militarily, um, diplomatically, that Israel doesn't care about human life. So why are we allowing ourselves to become so preoccupied with the question of whether or not Israel is uh, innocent because Hamas is using, under this particular definition of international law, human shields, a charge which it has presented no credible evidence for, and of which there can be no credible evidence produced by, you know, actors outside of Israel because no one has the, the resources. You know, Al Jazeera can't be expected to go and disprove every single claim um, of, uh, of of human shields that, that Israel is making. It simply doesn't have the resources to do that. I think we should also fundamentally question what the logic of human shields, uh, be, besides being a sort of um, uh, a loophole in international law that kind of allows, that lets Israel off the hook, what that suggests about Palestinians. It suggests that Palestinians are not human beings, but human shields. It dehumanizes Palestinians and renders them simply these kind of bargaining chips or sort of pawns um, uh, in, in a conflict, when actually we're just talking about ordinary people who have not who have not asked for this and who are not and who are not waging this war. Uh, so I think like we really need to try and understand why it's been such an effective rhetorical um, and sort of argumentative approach by Israel, because it just feeds into the idea that Palestinians are not human beings to begin with, something that the West, because of our sort of Israel propaganda saturated media environment, is primed to believe. Whereas on the flip side, as we were saying earlier, where if every Palestinian death is a terrorist death, because I 
either they are terrorists or they are uh, shielding terrorists. Every Israeli death, including the deaths of sergeants and majors and lieutenants and corporals in the in the IDF, is an illegitimate death, is a uh, tragedy. You know, Adam Schatz, in his uh, piece for the London Review of Books about uh, Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, described the first phase of that operation as typical guerrilla warfare and targeting legitimate military uh, military targets. But, you know, we're now in a position where every Palestinian is fair game and every Israeli killed is a terrorist attack. No, I think that's that's well put. I mean, I think it's also worth noting here because, it, you know, when it comes to what's legal and what's not legal, it again, I'm not an expert on water tanks. I'm not also not an expert on international law. It, it, it's very easy to see, though, how this argument about human shields could have been applied to basically every other liberation struggle that ever existed, right? So the IRA, they didn't have their fighters live in some sort of separate compound really far away from Belfast or Derry, right? They lived in ordinary communities because that's how, um, you know, anti-colonial struggles, asymmetric warfare, that's how it works, right? You will always have any 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 struggle you read about, the Vietnamese as well, you have the Viet Cong, the, the resistance army always lives among the people, right? And, and that might be in part because they think, well, obviously, if you, if, you, if you put up a big sort of building and say this is the headquarters of the IRA, it's not going to last very long, is it? That's kind of the nature of asymmetric warfare. One side has all of the military technological power and one side is more embedded in a, in a native population. right? So that, that's the nature of it. So you could make this argument about anyone. And with the IRA, we didn't just bomb whole streets in, in in Belfast or Derry. And if we did, I think, you know, there would have been some controversy about it. Places where we did do that. So we talked about this on a recent show. Um, so the anti-colonial struggle in Kenya. So what Britain did do there, there was the Mau Mau, which was a movement which killed a few civilians. I think it killed sort of 32 British civilians and it killed a couple of thousand Kenyan um, people who they believed to be, you know, collaborators to some degree. Um, so the Mau Mau were the big terrorist threat there from the UK's perspective. And what did we do in, resu- in, in response? We bombed shed loads of cities, right? Where we said lots of the Mau Mau are, are, are based. So we had exactly the same human shields argument where we had to bomb all these civilians because the Mau Mau were there. And we showed you a clip of um, sort of a, a British television host saying, well, until the Mau Mau are, uh, are found, lots of civilians are going to have to suffer. You know, exactly the kind of language you hear at the moment when a right-wing pundit says, oh, it's very sad that 10,000 people have been killed, but that's because Hamas used them as human shields. Exactly the same language. It's no longer radical to say it was a bad thing to do to bomb all of those cities. In fact, King Charles has just gone to Kenya and apologized for it, right? So King Charles hasn't gone to Kenya and said, oh, sorry, we bombed all of all of your cities and Kenyan civilians. It was because the Mau Mau were using you as human shields. No, we understand that that was an anti-colonial struggle, um, that the Mau Mau were resisting it, and that responding to that resistance by killing shed loads of civilians was a terrible thing to do, right? So, so we, we can look back 70 years on and say, oh, of course that was terrible. But when it's happening right now, suddenly it's so, so complicated. It's so, so complex. Easier to, to apologize about something that's in the past than recognize that what you're doing at the moment is fundamentally wrong. Regular viewers will know that we're currently running a fundraiser. We're around halfway to our goal of gaining 5,000 new regular supporters. If we get to that target, it'll enable us to continue our coverage of the situation in Gaza and set us up for 2024. That's a big election year. Probably it might actually be in in January 2025, but we're expecting it to be in 2024. If you appreciate our journalism and want to become a regular supporter, then head to navaramedia.com slash support. Of course, a big thank you to everyone who already funds us each and every month. You keep this show going. That link again, if you want to support independent media, is in the description box below. Since it launched its deadly bombardment of Gaza, the US has pledged $14 billion in extra aid to Israel, and it doesn't seem to come with any strings attached. Two weeks ago, the White House said they are not drawing any red lines for Israel. That statement was made by National Security Spokesperson John Kirby, and yesterday he repeated the line again. In late October, you had referred to the fact that the administration is not drawing any red lines for Israel. As the death toll for civilians in the Gaza Strip has gone up, I wanted to ensure, is that still the case, that the administration has no red lines? (laughs) That is still the case. So after white phosphorus has been dropped in heavily populated areas, after ambulances, hospitals and refugee camps have been bombed, and with 10,000 people already killed, 4,000 of them children, the US still has no red lines. No red lines. There's nothing that Israel could do that would make them stop giving them unconditional support. 
And that's despite the US admitting Israel is doing little to avoid civilian casualties. This tweet is from a CNN journalist. On Israeli efforts to minimize civilian casualties, John Kirby says, we have seen some indications that there, that, that there are efforts being applied in certain scenarios to try to minimize civilian casualties, but I don't want to overstate that. So essentially, oh, sometimes they do seem to be trying to minimize civilian casualties, but I don't really want to overstate that because a lot of the time they aren't. I mean, you don't have to try too hard to read between the lines to see that that's what's being said there, right? And fine, they'll say, oh, we've said that publicly. That means we're putting pressure on Israel. No, unless you stop sending them $14 billion of aid and, and shed loads of military equipment, saying something to some journalists is, is meaningless, right? The US has leverage. It likes to pretend it doesn't, but it has a lot of leverage here. So when might the US stop backing its closest ally as it pulverizes Gaza? The Economist has a new article out, which isn't reassuring. So they write, Although he now supports humanitarian pauses to allow more aid to enter Gaza, Mr. Biden has rejected calls for an outright ceasefire. But administration officials have made clear in a series of leaks that they doubt Israel has a coherent exit strategy in Gaza. They complain that Mr. Netanyahu is barely willing to discuss the topic and say they want to put their concerns on the record now, lest the war end badly. So we just want to put it on record. You know, we're going to put it on record. We're going to fund you and arm you to the teeth, even though we think this is a terrible idea, but we're just going to have it written down just in case anyone, and just in case anyone wants accountability afterwards, after you've killed 50,000 Gazans and achieved nothing from it. Oh, uh, ask the Americans why they supported that. Oh no, we, we have this little note. We sent it to Netanyahu. Um, can you try and kill a few less people and have some war aims? That, that, is, that is not going to excuse what you have done, right? The Economist goes on to write this. Sources in Washington think it will still be several more weeks before Mr. Biden pivots to talk of a truce. Um, but do not doubt that he will make such a shift. So he will make the shift eventually. This is a pointless war with no exit strategy, but we'll still give them a few weeks to keep killing innocent kids. Like, morally abject. That seems to be the message from President Biden right now. Meanwhile, in the United States, one of the only voices in Washington to have spoken any sense in recent weeks has been punished. Rashida Tlaib is the only Palestinian American representative in Congress. And after defending the phrase from the river to the sea, she has become only the third person this century to be censured by her peers. Being censured is, is one step down from being expelled from the House, and it has to be passed by a majority in the House of Representatives. Um, here's how Tlaib responded. I'm the only Palestinian American serving in Congress, Mr. Chair, and my perspective is needed here now more than ever. I will not be silenced, and I will not let you distort my words. Folks forget I'm from the city of Detroit, the most beautiful blackest city in the country where I learned to speak truth to power even if my voice shakes. Trying to bully or censor me won't work because this movement for a ceasefire is much bigger than one person. It's growing every single day. There are millions of people across our country who oppose Netanyahu's extremism and are done watching our government support collective punishment and the use of white phosphorus bombs that melt flesh to the bone. They are done watching our government, Mr. Chair, supporting cutting off food, water, electricity, and medical care to millions of people with nowhere to go. Like me, Mr. Chair, they don't believe the answer to war crimes is more war crimes. The refusal of Congress and the administration to acknowledge Palestinian lives is chipping at way at my soul. Over 10,000 Palestinians have been killed. Majority, majority were children. But let me be clear. My criticism has always been of the Israeli government and Netanyahu's actions. It is important to separate people and governments, Mr. Chair. No government is beyond criticism. The idea that criticizing the government of Israel is anti-Semitic sets a very dangerous precedent and it's being used to silence diverse voices speaking up for human rights across our nation. Now, how is that moment going to go down in the history books? We, we are facing the mass murder of Palestinian people, a potential genocide, and the only Palestinian American in Congress wasn't just not listened to, she was silenced. Now, as I said before on the show, I have no problem with the phrase, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That's the phrase that Tlaib defended. It's associated with a one-state solution in Israel-Palestine, which is a completely legitimate position. But even if you happen to not like the phrase, if you're very committed to a two-state solution and think from the river to the sea suggests something else, um, you should still know that this censure was an incredibly extreme 
response. And to know that, just look at what you can get away with saying in Congress. Now, Brian Mast is a Republican member of the House of Representatives. I would encourage the other side to not so lightly throw around the idea of innocent Palestinian civilians, as is frequently said. Uh, I don't think we would so lightly throw around the term innocent Nazi civilians during World War II. But we might have said innocent German civilians in World War II, right? Innocent German civilians. It's also the case that even people who were fighting for the Nazi army, right? You, you can still commit war crimes against them, you know? You're not allowed to just indiscriminately kill soldiers, for example, once they've, um, you know, waved the white flag, right? There are no innocent Palestinian civilians. That's what he said. It's very clearly a call for genocide, right? From the river to the sea, whatever you think about it, that is not a call for genocide. You might prefer a two-state and say, that's not my favorite chant, fine. But that guy was in Congress calling for genocide, essentially, right? There are no innocent Palestinians. There are no innocent Palestinians. What does that suggest? If Israel said, our goal is to destroy Hamas, and he's now speaking in Congress saying, essentially everyone in Gaza is Hamas, then what is he proposing? Rivka, I mean, what do you make of this? Rashida Tlaib censured for saying something incredibly reasonable, the only Palestinian American in Congress. And what you are allowed to say in Congress is that basically every Gazan is a, is a legitimate target. Mm. It's interesting, actually, because I think, you know, what we're seeing with the Brian, with the contrast you've just presented there between Brian Mast and what he was permitted to say uh, and Rashida Tlaib and what she was censured for saying mirrors the kind of military uh, uh, double standards that we apply to Israel, that the US is applying and certainly the UK is following suit to Israel. Israel has free reign. Israel has a blank check. Brian Moss can say whatever he wants. And Palestine is forced to live in, Palestinians are forced to live in an open air prison. Rashida Tlaib is being confined, continually constrained in what she can and can't say. It's the most shameful period of America's history, that at a moment when her own grandparents, her own grandmother, you know, in, in that video, she holds up a photograph, a framed photograph of her grandma who lives in the West Bank, while her own family are there suffering at the hands of this Israeli onslaught, she isn't allowed to speak about it. You know, it, it, it parallels, it almost, you know, it takes me back to the, the words of Prime Minister, Israel's former Prime Minister Golda Meir, when she said that there were no such thing as Palestinians when Israel um, was established. It's as if America doesn't even want to recognize the existence in its midst of a Palestinian woman. And I think actually, if we think about it, something very eerily similar is happening in UK politics, except it's even more invisible. You know, Rashida Tlaib, even though she's facing this um, censure, her being censured is headline, is, is front page news, you know, and that's because she's an enormously um, well-loved and well-known politician. I think, you know, the last uh, general election that she faced, she won by uh, a huge majority, something like 84%. Um, whereas in the UK, the kind of equivalent politicians, um, people like Leila Moran and the Lib Dems, uh, the Scottish First Minister, Hamza Yusuf, who's parents are in Gaza as we speak. Why is this not front page news every single day? Why is Hamza Yusuf not being given a platform to speak out about what is what his own parents are being subjected to in Gaza every day? It's because to do so would be to enormously disrupt the manufactured the manufactured consensus within Britain's political establishment, which contains within it people who are directly implicated in the ongoing struggle. You know, it's it, and, and so not only do we not have um do we have people like Rashida Tlaib being silenced in the UK, we don't even hear from these people. I think I saw one interview with Leila Moran from a few weeks ago and maybe Hamza Yosef did a, a press conference or something. But, you know, they, they've not even been given an ounce of the airtime um, that Rashida Tlaib has. But, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious the reason why, um, you know, commentators in the US and now uh, Tlaib's colleagues in the House of Representatives are fixating so much on, um, 
you know, this this phrase from the river to the sea. Uh, it's an interesting phrase, by the way, and I actually did an explainer on it on our um, Instagram recently. People should go and watch it. What people don't know is that it's it's mentioned, not only, it's often talked about as being um, cited in the Hamas uh, constitution of 2017, which I believe says something like, Hamas rejects any alternative to the full and complete liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea. Um, but it's also used in the Likud constitution, the constitution of the political party um, that Netanyahu leads. So the first clause of that charter says, between the sea and the Jordan, there will be only Israeli sovereignty. And I think it's really interesting if we compare these two things. One is demanding Palestinian liberation, Palestine will be free. And the other is demanding Israeli sovereignty, which is something completely different and suggests total uh, Israeli and, and Jewish control over Judea and Samaria, which is what it's talked, which is what it's referred to as in the Likud uh, Charter. So, you know, the idea that from the river to the sea is a uniquely Palestinian uh, phrase is completely false. It's cited right up there in the Likud Charter in a way more um, eliminationist way than we hear in, in, in the Hamas Charter. But then when we hear it on the street, it's, it's, it's even further removed. It's literally just a call for Palestinian freedom uh, from apartheid, from blockade uh, and from occupation between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. And I think the idea, it's really, it's, it's so telling to me that the idea that this contested phrase has been interpreted as a, in a singular way as, as genocidal towards Jewish people tells us a huge amount about whose forms of knowledge are valid and whose are not, whose existences matter and whose don't. If we have a fundamental disagreement about the meaning of a phrase, I say it means this and, and, and you say it means that, the idea that that we we should unilaterally be able to say no, actually it's this suggests who whose um, perspectives and whose epistemologies we care about. And in this case, it's Zionist and right wing Jewish epistemologies which are being are being privileged. You know, it's it's so fundamentally clear to me that this is not a call for Jewish genocide. That's not how I hear it. I'm a Jewish person. That's just simply not what I hear. But what is really clear is that Israel is, is using explicitly genocidal language about Palestinians, referring to them as human animals. You know, even earlier, we were talking about how Labour refers to uh, Palestine supporters as fleas. You know, uh, zoological terminology is a is a, a telltale sign of genocidal intent. And we know that Israel not only has that intent and has that rhetoric, but has that military capability. And the shifting of the discourse from kind of actual military violence to rhetorical violence is, is a straight up kind of distraction tactic. And it's been remarkably effective. I think that sort of point of who gets to say, I'm offended, so you can't say that is really telling. I mean, like, how does it feel for a Palestinian for, you know, to have 10,000 people, you know, people of your country being killed, most of them civilians, let's see, a shed load of them children, and then you just hear politicians repeat, Israel has a right to defend itself. What does Israel have a right to defend itself mean in that context? You know, can you imagine if you you went on the television after Hamas did the October the 7th attacks and said, well, Palestine has a right to defend itself, right? Why Why is this so different? Yeah. One of those is sayable and the other isn't, right? It's, it's, it's very, very odd. Well, it's not odd because it's very obvious what's going on. There is, it's, it seems to me to be clearly sort of tied up with racism, who is allowed to say things, whose offense matters. If a Palestinian is offended by um, the, people talking about them as human shields or saying that Israel has a right to defend itself and therefore bombing hospitals is okay, if they're offended by that, well, who cares? They're Palestinian, doesn't matter, right? If you have people who are pro-Israel um, you know, especially from the Jewish community, but other Zionists in general, who who think it's it's very, very upsetting to hear someone say, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Suddenly that has to get taken very, very seriously. It's talked about by politicians, it's talked about endlessly on Twitter, sort of this policing of who can say what. Why does one group of people's offence matter and, and another group of people's offence doesn't, right? And I think, to be honest, it's the Labour front bench who are, who are most guilty of this, of sort of policing what people who are sort of talking in favor of Palestine are allowed to say and not policing in any way whatsoever what they themselves say when it comes to the uh, the mass death of Palestinian people, the mass killing of Palestinian people. And I want to go back to the sort of topic that we started this section with, which was US support for Israel and how unquestioning and unconditional it has been. Because I want to show you a clip of an Israeli who is much more critical, who, who's asking for 
something else from the Americans. So Mayo's Inon is a Israeli man whose elderly father and mother were killed in the October 7th attacks. He had this message for those world leaders who are currently supporting the government of Benjamin Netanyahu. Can to ask Netanyahu to go? Or do you have to wait for the end of the war? Or? Because, you're, you're, because of your question yes. and your leaders and world leaders that are waiting for the war to stop before uh, they will stop supporting Israeli government, the war would never end. The war would never end as long as Netanyahu is in his office. So I'm crying to the world, don't support Netanyahu. Don't send us weapons. Don't se send us ships of war. Send us peace. Mm. Send us love. Send us reconciliation. Remember, that's, that's a man whose two parents were killed on October the 7th, and he speaks with such moral clarity, with such dignity, saying, don't, you know, this person who's in charge of Israel, right, he does not want peace. He is the person who's backing all the settlers in the West Bank. He's the person who, in his party's constitution, as you say, um, Rivka, wants all of, all of the, uh, the space between the river and the sea to be Israel. He, he doesn't think there are any Palestinians. And... Whatever support you give to Benjamin Netanyahu, he is going to use that support to that end. You really think that when the Americans send send weapons to Benjamin Netanyahu and shed loads of money to Benjamin Netanyahu, he thinks, "Oh, I'm only going to use I'm only going to use these weapons to fight terrorism, right? I'm only going to use this financial support to to make sure that Israel is strong within its 1967 borders." No, if you're supporting Benjamin Netanyahu, you are supporting Benjamin Netanyahu to do whatever he wants to do, and he's been able to do whatever he wants to do for the past decade or so. I mean, he's been in power for a very long time, hasn't he? Um, Rivka, very impressive, um, that man's words. I assume, though, it's, it's very much a minority position in Israel. I mean, do you have any insight on that? I mean, some, I've both personal and, uh, I suppose, more statistical. We have some polling from Israel, which suggests that there are mixed feelings about, um, well, that the war. There's certainly not mixed feelings about Netanyahu, though. There was a poll by Israel's Channel 12 recently, which suggested that 76% of Israelis think that Netanyahu should resign. But another poll published by the uh, Israeli newspaper Ma'ariv, uh, which suggested that 65% of Israelis do want a ground invasion, even though about half of uh, the country also wants that to, to not happen immediately. So there, there is definitely a sort of the fog of war that has whipped up um, a huge number of, of Israelis into a into a frenzy, as well it might. I mean, how would you or I respond if our if our country was um, was under attack? Um, and also, how would you or I respond if we were living in a country with a closed media environment? It's really important to stress that. You know, in in October, we we saw the Israeli uh, government pass emergency legislation which criminalized. Um, individuals, civilians and journalists who uh, damage national morale. We've also seen um, it introduce legislation which will allow it to shutter news sites and media platforms that uh, do the same, that, uh, that are undermining national security. Um, so Israel's written itself a blank check to effectively um, censor its own media environment, which it's done incredibly successfully, such that we don't hear uh, voices like like Maos, who you've just quoted there. Um, and usually people like him. Um, and, you know, I also saw a similar video of a 19 year old um, who was involved in the uh, massacre at a uh, Ba'ari kibbutz um, in Israel, who was saying something similar. And, you know, she was speaking on her own platform. Maos, I mean, I don't think that's an Israeli platform that he's um, speaking on there. These people are often having to circumvent the very closed Israeli media environment to have a hearing. But it is probably true to say that they that that the idea of um you know, a ceasefire um, is is a hugely unpopular one in Israel, even if people do place the blame as much with Netanyahu as they do Hamas. But yeah, it's really worrying. You know, I've been talking to people that I know in Israel, including members of my own family who are saying really worrying things. You know, like uh, I used to, uh, you know, support a two-state solution. I used to be on the left. But, you know, now how can you defend what's going on? I do think that uh, this war and the presentation of it in a very propagandized kind of Israeli media environment is radicalizing a huge number of Israelis, not least because, as we know, Israel has a mandatory um, sort of um, adult conscription, meaning that 
pretty much everyone knows a reservist, has family and friends that are reservists and, and are fighting this war actively. So, you know, the, the conscription ideologically as much as militarily of Israeli civilians into this war has been incredibly effective. Yeah, I think that's well put. And I think the idea, you know, everything I've seen, I don't really have any connections to, to, to Israel. I don't really know many people there at all. But um, sort of from, from what I've read and sort of seen and talking to people who do know people in Israel, like it sounds like, you know, it's quite extreme right now. And that makes it just even crazier for our governments to be giving Israel unconditional support. Basically, you're saying, oh, they're in this traumatic situation. That means they're lashing out. Oh, so what do we do? Oh, let's give them loads of weapons to make it as damaging as possible, right? If, if, if you, you know, let, let, let's, let's set aside the whole fact that, that Israel is colonizing the West Bank and has been sort of practicing apartheid and oppressing shed loads of people. Let's put that to one side for one moment, right? Now, let's just pretend that this is a normal country doing normal things. Now, it's, it's your friend, right? Your friend is, is upset. Um, they've, they've just had this, this big loss. Um, they're very, very angry. What do you do in that situation? Do you say, okay, you should probably calm down because what you're doing might not be in anyone's best interest, or do you hand them a gun? Because basically what we've done, I mean, again, this is sort of abstracting from the whole history of colonialism in Israel. So, I don't, you know, it's, it's a very specific analysis. But even if you were to accept that Israel is our ally, Israel is a friend, Israel is a good country, then when it's incredibly angry and irrationally lashing out, oh, well, let's give you more guns. Let's give you more weapons. Let's give you more support. That is the opposite that you should be doing. Whatever your analysis of the Middle East, unless your analysis of the Middle East is, I want a greater Israel and I want the Palestinians to be disappeared. If that is your analysis, then yeah, go on, give them as many weapons as you want, but I hope it's not. When the Rafah crossing between Gaza and Egypt was opened for the first time last week, foreign workers were able to leave. Of course, Palestinians weren't. They are still trapped in Gaza. But some of those who were able to get out are now telling their stories. Emily Callahan is a nurse for Doctors Without Borders and had been working as a nurse in Gaza for 26 days before she was evacuated to the US. Here she is speaking to CNN. We were, we were relocated about five times over the course of 26 days due to security concerns. And one of the places we wound up was the Khan Yunis training center. We call it KYTC. That's when people had evacuated to the south. So you were in the south of yes, Gaza. Yes, when we point. went to Wadi, below Wadi Gaza line. And there were, by the time we left there, there were 35,000 internally displaced people living alongside us. There were children with just massive burns down their faces, down their necks, all over their limbs. And because the hospitals are so overwhelmed, they are being discharged immediately after. And they're being discharged to these camps with no access to running water. There's 50,000 people at that camp now and four toilets. They're given two hours of water every 12 hours. There's and four toilets for 50,000 people. Yes. Um, and that's where we were living too. And they have these fresh open burns and wounds and partial amputations that are just walking around these conditions. And parents are bringing their children to us going, please, can you help? Please, can you help? And we have no supplies. Just sounds like hell, right? And again, this is not a natural disaster. It wasn't that an earthquake happened. What has happened is that one of the world's superpowers, one of the closest allies to the United States and the United Kingdom, is dropping thousands and thousands of bombs on a densely populated area and blocking supplies of water, food, and electricity. And what happens when you do that? Oh, yes, you get tens of thousands of people, many of them with severe burns, as she was talking about, many of them with partial amputations, as she was talking about, sharing four toilets without running water, right? This is just a hell on earth which is being created by our ally and people from all political parties, or from Labour and Tories at least, are going out and saying, yep, more of this, more of this, yeah, more of this. Uh, a ceasefire, that would be a terrible thing to do. Um, we need more of this because otherwise we're not going to be able to defeat Hamas. So sorry about those 50,000 people sharing four toilets, um, constantly worrying that their family members are going to get bombed, constantly worrying that they're going to get bombed. Because remember, being on a refugee camp doesn't stop you getting bombed in Gaza right now, right? But that's all fine and dandy, according to so many people in the West. Thank God um, we have nurses like Callahan um, on CNN sort of telling the truth about this. Um, Callahan, so the nurse there, also talked about the support she received from Palestinian staff um, working for Médecins Sans Frontières. 
They were standing between us and desperate people. They made sure that they were talking to every official that they could find, trying to push us through, trying to get us on the bus, trying to get us out. And we're standing there and we're watching these incredible men who have sacrificed everything for us, who have sacrificed time with their families, their own physical safety, their own water supply they were giving to us. And we're watching them fight to get us across the border, knowing that we were not bringing them with us. And they didn't, they didn't waver. Um, Ibrahim was right in the front with our passports, fighting so hard to get us on. And we get to Arish that night and find out his parents are dead. They were losing family members and friends. You, you said if, if it wasn't for your national staff, you think you would have been killed mm -hmm. by people who were just desperate. We either would have starved to death or run out of water. They were the ones that negotiated all of that. They, Gaza is a small city, so everyone knows everyone. And they would call in favors and call their friends and say, who do you know that has food? Who do you know that's open? Where can we get this? And they would drive all over the place to find water. And when we ran out of bottled water in Gaza, they were the ones that were able to figure out that the water truck was coming here at these times. And oh, I know this guy has a grocery store and uh, they still have power. So I think I can probably get something from them. Like we, when I say we would have starved to death without them, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Good answer to a very loaded question. Because you notice how Anderson Cooper said, so you wouldn't have survived. Is that because people were so angry and trying to kill you? Now, in, in the full interview, you can go watch it online. It's, it's worth the full eight minutes. Um, she does say that actually they did, they did, they were victims of aggression from people who were feeling very desperate and thinking that, you know, they're Americans, you're supporting this war, um, who are lashing out because it's, you know, a desperate time there, right? But I mean, Anderson Cooper there seemed to be saying, oh, and that, you know, this is so dangerous. The, the real danger in Gaza is the angry Palestinians. And she's saying, no, no, I, when I say uh, my life was at risk, I mean, there was no food, there was no water. I mean, obviously there were bombs dropping everywhere as well, right? Um, I think also important to note, and we keep saying this, you know, the number of people who are getting killed in Gaza right now means that anyone who knows anyone Gazan knows people who are just dying, you know, day after day, right? So she's saying it, it just so happened that one person who was working for her, who she says was acting so bravely and helping them get across the border, even knowing they wouldn't be allowed across the border, right? So you're helping people escape this living hell that you're in, you know, but you're doing it with dignity and grace. That person, his parents have been killed just the day before, right? Every time someone says, oh, we don't need a ceasefire, right now. That's hundreds more people, hundreds more parents, kids, brothers, sisters, you know, husbands, wives, people with dreams who are, who, are, who are being killed by this sort of rain of bombs and hell sort of just falling from the sky. And anyone who sort of doubts the, the death toll, I mean, we've done a specific video about how you know, the, the death toll from the Gaza Ministry of Health nearly always matches up or has always matched up um, to sort of UN statistics and even Israeli statistics at the end of these, these, these wars. Um, but just the, the number of people who have a friend who's died, have 20 family members who've died, right? They are clearly killing a large proportion of Gazans. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the case that everyone knows someone who's lost someone who lost someone last night, right? It's constant. You follow Palestinian people on, on Twitter, it's just constant, the number of people who are dying. Um, again, really moving testimony. It sounds so horrible. I can't, you know, I, I, it's difficult to imagine being there, right? And that perhaps made this next answer rising. Would you go back to Gaza? In a heartbeat, in an absolute heartbeat. Uh, my heart is in Gaza, it will stay in Gaza. The Palestinian people that I worked with, both our national staff in the office, as well as my staff at Indonesia Hospital were some of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life. Um, when everything went off um, and we got the notice to move south of Wadi Gaza, I was texting my, my nurses at Indonesia Hospital and I said, we, we lost a nurse weekend one. Um, he was killed when the ambulance outside the hospital was blown up. And I was texting them when we got the evacuation orders and I said, did any of you move south? Did any of you get out? Like, are any of you coming down this way? And the only answer I got was, this is our community. This is our family. These are our friends. If they're gonna kill us, we're gonna die saving as many people as we can. And I said, if I can ever have an ounce of the heart that you have, I will, I will die a happy person. They were incredible. I would like to send out a reminder that there are civilians seeking shelter there and that my doctors and nurses didn't leave out of loyalty to their community. And I know that there is an idea being pushed right now that anyone that stayed behind 
is going to be considered some kind of a threat. And I want to remind people that the people that stayed behind are heroes. The people that stayed behind are, are they know they're going to die and they're choosing to stay behind anyway. It's so powerfully put. I mean, there were lots of people sort of on I think, you know, rightly saying, oh, it's a shame that it has to be this white lady who sort of gives this message to America. And if they were Palestinian, I'm sure Anderson Cooper would have asked them to condemn Hamas and that would have taken up half the interview. Um, but, but nonetheless, Rivka, I mean, that was an incredibly powerful testimony there. Yeah. You know, I think that I, I totally get that frustration that why does it have to be Emily Callahan rather than, you know, a Palestinian or, you know, someone who isn't a blonde white lady uh, saying this. But I think there's also an important pragmatism here, which is that Emily Callahan has recognized that she's effectively infiltrated the CNN studio. You know, C CNN has been singled out by Palestinians and their supporters as being one of the most um, sort of pro-Israel and sort of partial and biased um, platforms, you know, in America in its coverage of uh, this war to the extent that, um, you know, a, a video went viral recently of its chief uh, international correspondent, Clarissa Ward, being confronted by a Palestinian um, in Gaza, I believe, saying like, why are you doing this? Um, so, you know, Emily Callahan is well aware of the media environment that she's entering and the kind of questions that she's likely to be asked and the framing that's likely to be given. And she's also aware that um, her position in Médecins Sans Frontières means that she can't say anything that's explicitly um, uh, taking a side in the conflict. But she does something really brilliant, which is that she recognizes that they're not going to think that I'm a threat. And they're also not going to allow me to say anything that's explicitly pro-Palestinian. So what I'm instead going to do is just humanize the people that I worked with. Because coming from me, it's going to be taken immensely more seriously. And saying that they're humans rather than that, you know, their political cause is just or justified or the resistance is legitimate or anything is really difficult to argue with. It's impossible to argue with the profound emotional connection that someone who spent, you know, three weeks uh, treating child amputees in Gaza has with her colleagues. You can't like Anderson Cooper just can't argue with that. So you know, I'm sure that CNN thought that they were inviting a, a nice white lady on from a, uh, you know, a medical charity, a humanitarian um, organization to come and say some sort of nice meaningless words about Palestine, but she's actually like used the platform that she's been given an incredibly smart and sort of uh, very difficult to criticize way, which is, you know, and that's not to say that Anderson Cooper didn't have a good go at it. You know, shortly after um, you just cut the clip there, he asks her, well, okay, so if they're so brave for staying, would you have gone back? And she just says, yeah, I'd go back. Like, you know, she's, she, 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 she has, thought about the kind of questions that she's going to be asked and the ways that they're going to try and corner her into uh, criticizing her colleagues, into pointing to the divisions between Palestinians and Hamas. Um, but she just completely swerves it at every turn. I think it's like a really brilliant example of how to, how to use the platform that you are given in an incredibly unjust society as a, a white aid worker for incredible good. I think she's like an incredibly smart person. Um, let's wrap up there. We'll end with a sliver of good news, um, which is the Senate. So the Welsh Parliament has backed a motion calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and Israel. Um, you know, symbolically important. I mean, it, it would matter a lot more if that happened in Westminster because it's Rishi Sunak and the Westminster government that control foreign policy and, and the support we give um, to Israel. I think we should be sanctioning them. Of course, we're doing the opposite. We're supporting them. Um, Rivka, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Always a pleasure. Never a chore, Michael. <laughs> And thank you all for tuning in. This show will be back again tomorrow from 6 p.m. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.